Hello, and welcome to this month's edition of the Enabling Greatness podcast. I'm your host, John, and this week we interview Solvay Nicholas. Solvay is passionate about people and evolving the paradigm of learning, focusing on technology, future skills, data, and strategies that make an impact. She was an advisor to the chairman at the Abu Dhabi Department of Government Support, as well as the dean of the Abu Dhabi School of Government. Her experience also includes strategy consulting at Columbia University in New York, in the USA, where she developed and launched new postgraduate master's programs. Within this podcast, we really focus on how the world is changing, both for academia and organizations, and the roles that culture, strategy, and leadership really play within this. Hi, Solvay. Welcome to the Enabling Greatness podcast. Good morning, John. Great to be here. Thanks so much for the invite. Thanks for joining us. So for our viewers, please could you give them just a little introduction into who you are, what you do, how you do it, and how you got there? Perfect. I am, My name clearly is Solvay Nicholas. I have been living in the Middle East, the GCC, for about 11 years from the U.S. originally. And most of my work has focused on professional development, higher education, and in the region, domestic human capital development with a ultimate goal of you know economic growth and development within the gcc countries wow fantastic <laughs> now thinking about your experience so you know obviously i know bits about you know what you've done you know you've had a big helping hand with organizations and also academia and something that i'm really seeing is that they're changing and obviously covid has made particular changes in necessity but it's been feeling like these changes have been happening the past few years. You know, what do you think has caused this? And also, where do you think it's going? Well, I, th I agree. I think what I've had a very unique position because I've been in academia, uh, you know, in higher education and executive education at Columbia and Wharton in the U.S. And now on kind of the buy side, if you will, on the, co the consumer side of education, you know, specifically here in Abu Dhabi, working to develop government employees, but around the region with a focus, again, on the, the domestic human capital and the need for long-term vision with related to the skills necessary to grow the economy. And in that position, you see very explicitly the disconnect between education and the market. Now, I don't think that is, that, you know, that is not malicious. That is not, you know, it's really an issue of change in fundamentals that haven't been addressed. You know, four months ago, the whole world was talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And while COVID has usurped that position in everyone's minds, the truth is nothing has really changed about the fundamentals of that disconnect. The reason people have been seeing that for so many years, and I would say the 10 at least, maybe 15, and it's, it was sort of showing the, the cracks in the system. You know, the, the educational infrastructure, if I may back up, was built, on, was built around and f built on the fundamentals of the first and su second industrial revolution, which were basically creating the British Empire and the American industrial complex, both of which needed standardized workforce that would do, you know, would have a skill set, which in the case of the British Empire, that could work globally in the absence of technology. That makes complete sense, given the needs at the time. Now, that is very fundamental, and there's a lot of things that have changed, but there's a lot that has stayed the same. And unfortunately, what we have starting to realize is that while things around the edges have changed, the fundamentals have not, um, the assumptions have not. And so, you know, in the U.S. specifically, we are education to take a test, which is not all that conducive to innovation, entrepreneurship, and agility, which are the skills we need now. And the problem is the rate of change of the needs of the market has great, is so much more exponential than it used to be. Those cracks were already starting to show. And then you throw COVID on top of it. And now all of a sudden, they excel, it's an accelerant. Yeah. It's really just highlighting the cracks that were already there, but desperately need to be addressed. And it's an infrastructure problem. I mean, it's as simple, it's as basic as accreditation as a, you know, and I'll give an example. When I worked at a university, 
to launch a master's degree program, you had to have the content and the program structure, and then you start the approval process, which took two years. From it, with the, the implementation of technology and industry now, can we really credibly say that content we developed two years ago is now ready for the market, is relevant to the market? Yeah. And so, no, is the short answer for those at home who, you know, those playing along at home, we all know that, no, you cannot have two-year-old content in a master's degree program and expect anyone to think that's cutting edge. Unfortunately, that's the infrastructure. So this is an infrastructure question. You know, we have... You know, we, you, what you're starting to see, especially in the emerging markets, is an adoption and an acceptance of professional certifications because they change more rapidly, they're industry relevant, and unlike degrees, which have been the, you know, the, the currency of education, a, a certification, you know, an ACCA accounting certification is globally the same. It is actually proof of mastery of skill. Mm. And that is what industry is looking for versus a lot of degrees, which are very disconnected from market needs. Now, I am a huge proponent of liberal arts education. I think learning for the sake of it is important, but I think the disconnect from the consumer is growing very rapidly. And we're at a massive inflection point in education. Yeah. I mean, that's such a great insight and so valuable, you know, really thinking about, you know, what have we been doing it's for the vast majority of cases not relevant you know time changes a lot of things mm -hmm. and i think you know especially with organizations you know when we talk about change obviously when change comes there needs to be a change in culture because your mm -hmm. culture is your organization i mean how would you see organizations shifting to kind of meet these changes that are coming i heard a great quote recently um and that is structure, your structure is your strategy. And in this context, I would say your culture is your strategy and culture, you know, or if you want to do it on a continuum, there's structure, there's culture, there's strategy. And because, it, well, the answer to this goes back to part of my answer to the last one. What are your assumptions? Go back to the basics because maybe it doesn't need to change. Maybe your industry, your organization, is still fit for purpose the way it is, the way it's operating. But you have the infrastructure you have because of the culture you have, the structures you have. It, it's not an accident. And so if you want to evolve to meet the new demands, i.e. the, you know, the post-COVID environment, you have to question some of your fundamental assumptions, which I admit is very hard to do. Assumptions are, you know, culture is the way we do things. It's the things you do when no one is, it's a, what people do when no one is looking. It's what are the driving factors that drive decision making? One of the questions I love to ask, well, backing up, how should culture change? Stop and take a step back and question your assumptions. What business are you in? What service are you providing? What problems are you solving now? Ask those questions again. Ask questions about your infrastructure because people sort of think culture is, you know, having a, this outside, it's an extra project. It's a special team. Culture is, if you go back and look at your infrastructure and your levers, you, and you have aligned those with the outcomes that you want, then you have, you solve 80% of your culture issues. I had a, I, I am in the middle of a project and I'm doing a project and they're wisely recognizing the need for a culture change and using culture as a strategic differentiator, which I think is fundamentally critical right now. Yeah. And when I start a project like that, I ask, what is the, you know, you always end up speaking to the senior leadership. What is the aspirational state? What do you want? And they want to, you know, delight their customers, basically be helpful. They want their front line. It's a service-based organization. They want their front line to be helpful. Okay, fine. I asked privately offline to some of the mid-level managers the question of if you could define to me in one sentence what it is that drives the decision-making within your organization. If in a, you're alone in a room and you have to make a decision, what is the first key thought that comes to mind? And the answer was follow process, follow the rules. 
Now, I don't think I need to explain why that's a problem when it comes to the aspirational goal. But that's the fundamental level of question. If you can't answer for me in one sentence, what is your driving decision-making guideline? And that is the same as your aspirational state. There's your problem. And, you've, and if it, in this case, was as explicit as follow the rules, you've got your answer as to what needs to be done to try to solve the problem. Now, there's an enormous leap there, and we have a lot of work to do, but that, you know, that gives the answer. And I would suggest that in a ch time of change like this, one, don't be, don't try to go back to normal. Don't expect it to go back to normal. If it does, maybe fine, but take the opportunity to ask the questions and go through the process that will des that is desperately needed. Because if you don't, and normal is your aspirational state, you can't possibly hope for that to be a strategic differentiator. And the organizations in your industry or out of it are going, you're, are going to disrupt you, are going to supplant the leaders in certain organizations. I think education as a space is rife for disruption and is going to be disrupted, at least in the university post-secondary space by a non-industry player. Because quite frankly, the industry itself is too inherently lockstep with quick regulation, government, infrastructure to be able to be agile and do what they need. And getting back to the point of culture change, we've got, you know, a good example I like to use in the United States, we, right now diversity is a very key subject. And that's unique culturally to the US in some ways, but the example is relevant as a baseline for thought to anyone. If you genuinely want diversity in your workforce, look at your hiring practices. Because if you maintain a requirement of an undergraduate degree for an entry-level position, which if you look back at history, I guarantee wasn't a requirement 15 years ago, but has become one through you know, recessionary cycles. All of a sudden, by definition, you eliminate 77% <clears throat> excuse me, of African Americans and 84% of Hispanics in the United States. If you genuinely want diversity, look at something as simple as your hiring practice. And that can fundamentally change the future options. I'm not saying lack of qualification. There are other ways to get qualification experience. In, you know, and let's face it, if the biggest complaint from the market to question one is the disconnect between education and the needs of the market, then is really an undergraduate degree necessary? You're going to do an onboarding with them anyway. There are other programs you're, want, you're up in others that people can get experience in. So anyway, back to asking the fundamental questions and looking at your infrastructure because your culture is driven by your structures, your hiring, your rewards, your punishments, all of that. Yeah. That was and a I, very long answer for you. <laughs> no, so insightful. And I think, you know, one thing that I really love that you were really touching on is how do organizations really communicate internally? You know, not just at the highest levels, because obviously there is, you know, a grand plan at the highest levels, but really how do you talk to your individuals who are on the front line? You know, the people that really understand what it is that the business does, you know, they're, they're in the thick of it and really understanding from them, how can you actually create the results that you want to create or what are the realistic aspirations? You know, I know from, you know, quite a few organizations back in the UK, whereby they'd had taglines like our customers are at the center of everything we do. Fantastic. When was the last time you talked to them? Mm -hmm. You know, you might think that they want to have their name said three times during a call, but in truth, what they really want is they want to wait less time on a phone call to sort something that matters to them. How do you fix that? You know, what's the job to be done? You know, and that's something that really is a big focus is what's the actual problem and how mm -hmm. can you, in theory, help that? Talk to your organization. And I think, you know, this kind of shifts us through to a great point of, you know, we're talking about culture and change within that, but it's also, in order for that to happen, your people need to know the why behind that. Just telling them that we're going to change doesn't get people on board. They need to understand the why. What is the benefit? What's in it for them? What's in it for the organization? How are you working together? 
And really a solid strategy is fundamental to that. I mean, strategy is key. People need to understand why they're doing things. Kind of from your perspective, you know, how have you seen this being implemented, you know, effectively? And what can organizations actually do to, you know, do that effectively? Well, I think to that point, strategy as a concept is very important. And I think it's fundamental. Now, I think first in this process, this evolution, especially in the COVID time, historic strategic models and processes really need to be reevaluated and changed. The business school models that have been taught for the last 30 years are questionably relevant in the modern age. You know, it, there really is an end to sustainable competitive advantage. And we've got to start evaluating strategy as an idea of constant little change, constant agility versus a big grand plan necessarily, which links very directly to your point about communication, which is, you know, I'm quoting Rita McGrath here, but you know, snow melts around the edges. What you need to know in your industry for your organization is from your customers is at the, the farthest point from the CEO, basically, because it's at the frontline staff, it's at the customer, you know, the customer service level. So yes, there does need to be a communication mechanism. Well, I would mention back to my last point, there needs to be a review of the structures that those people live in, because I guarantee you, if you're not getting that feedback, it's because they feel inhibited to do that in some way. There's yeah. not a mechanism. Their manager doesn't encourage it. There's some punishment for doing so. They have to follow the rules above all else. Really look at that because this is not rock and science. You have built, your, you've got what you've built. Look at what you've built. Two, strategy is lost on the front line. They don't get it at all. So, because it, it's, it's always talked about in this grand 10 year, five year plan kind of way. So talk about behaviors. I don't need you to understand the strategy necessarily, but you feel free to explain, you know, your link to it is this, but mostly the execution of the strategy at your level looks like this. This is a behavior that supports our strategy, i.e. in the example I was using before, being helpful looks like X. You know, there's my, lo I love the example, the Waldo, uh, the, the Ritz Carlton example. You know, every single person in that organization, or at least at one time, every single person in that organization was empowered. I think it was for, to do anything a customer needed up to $500. They didn't have to ask permission. They didn't have to do janitor, you know, cleaning front desk, did, you know, housekeeping didn't matter if a customer wanted and you know, needed something, they were empowered to help them and support up to X amount of money. And if, if you really, you know, that's a policy. That is something that they know they're able to do and feel empowered to do it. And so again, I really, it's about look at what's stopping them. If you go to work with the premise that people want to do a good job, which is my personal driving motivation, people do not get out of bed, most people, when they're starting, you know, wanting to be a jerk, you know, go to the office, you know, not do a good job. I feel the same way about corruption and scandal. Nobody gets up and plans to commit fraud one day. Yeah. Nobody. They get up and they respond to their circumstances. They respond to the policy. They say, I have to make my quarterly numbers. I have to make my weekly numbers, monthly, whatever. I have to follow the rules. If that's the driving decision-making factor, I will follow the rules despite what my customers might need. It's, a, you know, I heard, a fa I heard a faculty say in class years ago, that benefit of being in executive education is you literally get to spend your career with the guys that wrote the book. But his expression was the tyranny of baby steps. And it is the tiny decisions that get you to where you are, usually not massive, really grand ones. And the tyranny of baby steps is how you get through, get to scandal and it's how you get to triumph, quite frankly. Yeah. Because... It's what you empower people to do one day, every day, every moment. And that is what you're going to end up with. Yeah, it's, I mean, when we really think about it, and I think, you know, that tyranny of baby steps is so true. And, you know, from what we've been talking about is, you know, culture, you know, those baby steps, you know, how is it that people can be negatively impacted with those baby steps? Is it that you have a policy in place that just, just irks people 
a particular way. Let's say, for example, you know, you have a sickness policy whereby if people are away for X amount of days, they have to be put on a contract. You know, unfortunately, people get ill. You know, we are fallible as human beings. It's what happens. And then putting somebody on a contract for that, it's just going to put a bitter taste in their mouth or making them do things that don't make sense and they haven't been listened to. I mean, when, you know, we kind of boil these down, you know, leadership has such a crucial part in all of this. They have that, you know, culture, they have that strategy. That's really where they're pushing. And, you know, what do you kind of feel is the key components to great leadership really moving forward? I think that's a great question because I think leadership has a number of components. One, right now with COVID, leaders within any organization, and again, as I'm quoting John Sinai here, they need to mourn their future memories. It, they're literally, we have to allow people frequently at leadership, but mid to up, what did they plan to do this year? What did they plan to do next year? The estimates that the U.S. Recover, economy won't recover for till 2030. Wow. Again, there is no back to normal. So if we think leadership won't have to change through this, we're being incredibly naive. But step one in that, mourn your future memories, mourn your plans, mourn what you expected to happen out of all of this. You know, where you expected to be, what job you expected to have, what outcomes you wanted. Get, get over it, you know, to really old cliche and the cheese has moved. Like this is just not gonna look like we expected it to for a very long time. So I would tell the leaders to take a moment, stop and accept just, you don't know what's gonna happen. Nobody knows what's gonna happen. And what you planned is the only thing we know is not definitely not going to happen. Yeah. And then to your next point, start asking the right questions and start listening. Leadership, I think culturally we have mistaken leadership with answers, with decision-making, with do this, with in directives. And if ever there was a time for that to not be appropriate, it's now. Now, do we need leaders to ultimately make a decision? Of course. <laughs> but to walk in and assume your leader has any idea what to do is naive because the, nobody knows what's going to be happening now. So I would say leadership the courage to be a leader now is greater than ever before because now it's when you have the courage to say, I don't know, let's figure this out together. This is still the goal. Maybe, maybe not, maybe reevaluate the goal, but this is the, how are we going to get there? But there's never been a better time to do, to change, to qu ask the questions. Who's going to, who's going to question you for asking the questions at this point? Who's going to say, no, don't, Go back to the fundamentals. Don't evaluate the market. Don't take the changes that have happened. It's perfect. It is an opportunity leaders have never had before to say, you know what? Maybe we weren't doing this ideally. Let's push this change through because we desperately need it. We have no idea if we're going to survive without it. And if you can create that thought agility, you can start to create a corporate agility, which is what's going to be necessary. You know, the structure, the dogmatic commitment to what you've always done is the sure best way to fail post COVID because somebody is going to be coming in to disrupt what you, your company, your industry is doing. Yeah. And it really is. I think it's embracing change because, you know, we have seen there have been so many industries that thought that they were untouchable, you know, taxis. Then Uber came along, yeah. blockbuster video, you know, and when we look well, at some of those. You're, that's a brilliant example because if you look at um, the, the, the changes that came out of 2008, the last major crisis, yeah. where mass, there's the, you know, they weren't, industries were disrupted by what they now call arena players, non-industry players. Uber disrupted, Uber's a platform. Yeah. Uber's not a transportation company. Airbnb is a platform. Again, now a huge number of the disruptions that we now take for granted were platform disruptions. But those same organizations, you know, Uber itself is being massively disrupted by COVID yeah. because, you know, and I, you know, is that maybe that will have all of a sudden the driverless car 
because nobody wants to be around strangers, you know, who knows? But I think mo many, many industries are potentially going to see arena disruptions, not industry disruptions. And I think that's back to my point before, I almost guarantee education is gonna be among them because arena players, especially large arena, you know, the example I like use in education is last year, AT&T, Accenture, Oh, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the other two firms, but Amazon and Amazon, that's NBC. what it was. They all put together and said, we want, we're going to spend $6 billion in education on our people. Part of that is PR because yeah, Amazon is going to end up automating some of their people. But part of that is, in my opinion, players who have a market capitalization that promises extraordinary growth into the foreseeable future. At, Company scale, when you're at that scale, there is very little chance you can do that, continue, you know, even with COVID, shipping things. You're going to have to move into new markets. Amazon, as an example, has already proven their willingness to try to, they're being handed high health care, which is really one of the only other industries as big as education where that kind of growth can come. Well, if they've invested that much money, they're trying to learn the market. They're trying to explore the market. And they're either going to acquire, partner, or go it alone. My guess is in some form of the education sector to disrupt it for the players that are already there. And they've got the platform, they've got the technology. I don't think it's a big stretch to think they might try that. Will it be them? Who knows? I'm not, you know, labeling a bet on that, but I am saying that arena players, non industry players, are where people need to worry and where very few people spend their time looking. So at a time like this, when leadership is challenged, culture is challenged. It is the time to look at your model, question your assumptions, and back to the core of my, you know, my heart, my, my background, make sure your people know how the, the skills, train them on the skills necessary to be ready for whatever's coming next. You know, it's not, you can't, you know, expect a radical shift like that and think people are just going to organically figure it out. You do need to sh put a structure in place that allows them to do that, but it starts at the top and the recognition that the leaders now don't know what's coming either. And they've got to reevaluate and upskill themselves. Yeah. I think that's some absolutely incredible points. And I think, you know, kind of joining on with that arena players, you know, when we think about disruption and the way that people have changed and we've changed our habits and how culture, like just country people, cultures have changed, you know, normalizing things. So Airbnb staying at somebody else's house, pre-Airbnb, that sounded like madness. But the more it becomes normalized and the more that an arena player gets into education, that normalizes that online education is, you know, there, it is able to be utilized, the benefits of that. And then looking at whether it is nano degrees, whether it is, you know, taking an MBA and being able to do it wherever you want and being able to then pull on, you know, incredible speakers, TED speakers, and just being able to do that. And then that changing the way that organizations then learn and then the acceptance of that and what that means going forward. So I think there's some incredible times to come. I agree. And I think there'll be a dual backlash after this whole experience, because I think for many people, they were thrown into, you know, online learning, remote learning in the worst possible way. Let's face it. This is a if you want a good learner experience, that takes design, that takes planning in a, in a remote technology enabled environment. It can be done, but it, it takes a lot of skill on the behalf of the facilitator, it takes instructional design, it takes thought about the process, which is mo most people did not have the time to do. Now, there are some tremendous heroes who have killed themselves to make this as good as possible. But let's face it, the learning experience for an enormous number of students hasn't been ideal. Having said that, what I think we, we're never going to walk back from is the idea of technology-enabled learning. Some of it can be remote. Some of it can be face-to-face. -face. And it can be, to your point, it must be more granular. It has to be to the need of the individual. Now, I tend to focus on tertiary and professional education, but individuals need to find what they need when they need to know it, not only because you know, we shouldn't be learning to test. We shouldn't, you know, are you going to memorize certain things? Of course, but things are changing too rapidly. We've known, doctors have known this forever. Doctors are required to keep their skills current every single year. And thank God for all of us that they do. Yeah. 
Why the rest of us don't do that is a mystery to me because especially now every industry is rapidly changing. So we now have to change the ethos, the culture as individuals, as organizations and as countries to say learning has to be ongoing, really lifetime, not just paying lip service to it yeah. at the point of need almost, because let's face it, most people don't do knowledge transfer particularly well. They learn a concept and then they struggle to apply it because they just don't see the direct connection. And so we have got to find a way to make, you know, through technology in many cases, to enable people to access that information in real time, uh, you know, keep their skills current on a year or biannual basis at the very least. I mean, there's the, the studies now show, depending on which one you read, that the shelf life of skills is as short now as five years or 18 months, to down to 18 months used to be kind of a career could be, you, your skills would last you a career. Now, the best you can hope for is five years, which means throughout the course of your career, if you don't change your skills six to eight times, and that's assuming the five-year model doesn't accelerate, which is not a reasonable assumption, but assuming it doesn't, you have to change your skills six to eight times, which gets back to one of our original conversation points. Is an undergraduate degree really that relevant? You know, is Again, a big fan of it. There's a lot to be said for it. But is that a requirement 20 years in? After you've been in the market, you know, I use, you've heard me use this example before. If, like me, you have an undergraduate bachelor's degree in marketing pre-social media, of what value is that? Yes. Now, I didn't go into that field. It's obviously, you know, I always feel the need to say to the listeners, I have kept my skills relevant and have degrees beyond that. But be realistic. If you're interviewing someone 20 years into their career for a job that they have done for 20 years, do you need them to have an undergraduate degree? Or have they kept themselves relevant to the market? Is it really just a check the box exercise? And so I say we look at nano credentials. We look at continuous learning, technology enabled learning, and our culture of learning within an organization. And if that's not there, you have a much bigger problem because your people will be out of date very rapidly. Yeah. Wow. Some incredible points. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much for joining us. If people want to get in touch with you and they want to find out more, how can they do that? I am active on LinkedIn. So it's sold, you know, just if you Google or LinkedIn Solvay Nicholas, um, there is only one. There you go, know, that's the upside of a name like mine. Um, and that's really for most people probably the best way to connect with me. Wonderful. Well, Solvay, thank you very much for joining us on the Enabling Greatness podcast. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.